Hello, everybody. This is PYM Live, uh, otherwise known as Christy Casey Sanders from Plan Your Meetings. We are coming to you today uh, with an interview with Dr. Melissa Gracious about time management tips. Um, so, Dr. Gracious. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. I know this is something that a lot of our readers and audience members really struggle with because when you are planning meetings and events, you can be planning sometimes thousands a year. Right. Um, <laughs> or if you're not planning thousands a year, you might be tasked with planning meetings and then a bunch of other responsibilities. Absolutely. But that's not really different from what a lot of people are facing in corporations, at nonprofits, and even in government situations right now. Um, can you first off just kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got interested in time management? Yes, I will. Um, my name is Melissa Gracious. By the way, Christy, I'm having a, ba a feedback loop of the recording of the, your voice is coming back through my, my earphones. I'm so sorry, folks, <laughs> but it's really hard to talk and listen at the same time. That's okay. Um, you may want to check your browser windows. It's possible if you have open an event. Oh, that's probably me. Video. Thank you, Where? everybody, for your patience. All right, <laughs> good to go. All right, we're back on. Okay, so my background. Uh, I spent 10 years in corporate America, and in that time frame, I realized that there were multiple competing demands. And that is, like, like you said, you know, with meeting planners, with anyone in corporate America, the multiple competing demands are pretty standard. And by nature, by the way, I am... <laughs> I am a fly by the seat of my pants, um, take things spontaneously kind of person. That's that's my personality type, and that wasn't working for me it, from the time that I started my first job. I, I needed to be very organized, very methodical. I needed to sp to spend time planning and organizing. It, it took me, oh goodness, seven years of self-education and, um, and reading books and taking training classes and all sorts of things in order to just feel like that I was I was effective, that I was able to get stuff done that I needed to get done. And you know, about six years ago when I was working, I realized it really shouldn't have to take people that long. It, it shouldn't be that difficult. And, and so as my, my, my darling husband says, I I up and quit my job and I opened up my company MVG Organizing Solutions and I help my clients be more effective and productive at work by designing organizing systems that help them manage their time, manage their email, reduce their paper and, um, and improve the balance between work and life. That's that's my my passion and my mission. So that's what I do and I work one-on-one -on -one with clients. I do keynote speaking and breakout sessions and seminars. I do enterprise-wide consulting. Um, I helped a large company reduce paper prior to a move a few years ago and and it's just a, the whole mission and I hope that the, the, the viewers today and those who see this, this broadcast afterwards will will buy into this. The whole mission is to help people on a day-to-day -day basis make good decisions and choices and keep things where they need to be kept so that they can find what they need to find when they need it and do what they need to do when it needs to be done. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know what's funny is I think there are a lot of people who weren't really raised with any kind of training on systems. I know that uh, until I moved into my first house with my um, husband, I, it didn't occur to me to have a place where I put my keys in the same place every right. day. Um, so, you know, I know when I was in an office setting, my desks were always covered with paper and it always mm -hmm. took me forever to find what I was going to do, but that's yes. how I worked best. So I'm really excited to hear some of the tips that you have to share with our Thank audience because I might you. also be <laughs> in some of them as well. Got to find um, your keys. <laughs> well, now they go in the same place yes. all the time. Excellent. Um, cool. So, you know, you consult with a lot of different businesses. Um, so I was wondering, what are you finding people struggling with the most right now? What I, time management-wise, the, the first thing I ask a client when I come into their office is I say, okay, tell me how you are keeping track of what you need to do and by when. And, I, and then I just kind of sit back and listen. And typically, they'll say, well, I have you know, a list right here, and then I've got this app on my phone, I put some stuff in there, and then I have my email inbox, and anything that's in there I haven't done yet, and then, you know, I have this stuff swirling around in my head, and 
and, and, and the list can go on and on and on and on. So the one thing I find people struggling with the most right now is, and they're bringing it on themselves, they're keeping too many lists. Some lists are man-made, you know, you, you sit down, you make a list. Some lists are naturally occurring, such as those that in your email inbox is just a naturally occurring list of things to attend to. And, and not consolidating all of those lists into one place to one location where they can effectively prioritize and juggle and weigh this versus that. Um, that's the main thing I see people struggling with right now. Additionally, people will sometimes keep multiple calendars. They'll have their personal calendar and their work calendar and their phone calendar and their wall calendar and their desk blotter and, all, and, and multiple calendars. Again, just keeping things in so many places. So the, the lack of consolidation, Christy, is the is one of the main things that I see people struggling with that and they may not even realize that it's causing them so much fracture in their focus and in their attention and so much extra work to maintain all of those different places. So then what would be some tools that people can employ to consolidate that information. Um, and I also, before you answer that, I've, I've forgot to welcome our virtual audience and to remind you guys, if you want to ask questions, um, you feel free to tweet at me at PYM Live and that'll pop up on my phone immediately. Or uh, there should be a Q&A app um, that's available to you if you're viewing it from the Plan Your Meetings page. If you're viewing it from the actual event invite itself, you should be able to put a comment on that and have it pop up for me. Um, so, sorry to interrupt you, Melissa. No, oh, no I just wanted problem. to make sure that people knew that th it wasn't just a one-way broadcast, that we Absolutely. actually are interested in, in addressing your pain points and, you know, while we have Dr. Gracious's ear. So, um, so you were going to share with us some ways of consolidating these calendars right. and these lists so they're in one central location. Absolutely, which makes it a whole lot easier to go to one place rather than, you know, six. So with, uh, let's start with calendar. With a calendar, whenever you're working in an office with more than one person, ca calendars need to be in a format that is shareable. I, I'm, I, whatever, that's a word, I don't know. But um, in, in electronic calendars are really just a best practice right now. Now it, it can be a, a shared Google Calendar, it can be, a sh you know, a Outlook calendars are by default shared um, to you know, with limited uh, details. Um, SharePoint calendars, in anything that can be very easily shared because one a, a main point of inefficiency when, when people are maintaining a paper calendar, for example, is that no one else can see that but you. So I do recommend that in order to avoid the, well, are you free on Thursday at 3? No, no, no. Well, okay, what about Friday at 9? Well, no, what about Monday at 2? So save yourself those inefficiencies and consolidate onto an electronic calendar and give other people access to the level of detail that they are, that is warranted in your situation. So consolidate it onto one calendar and ditch all the others. That's one of the hardest parts because I have people holding their Franklin planners to their chest and going, but I love it. And I, I, But I do recommend, especially for calendars, that you pick an electronic calendar that, that you can share with the people that um, need to be able to collaborate with you. So that's one thing. Now, to-do list, different animal altogether. Eight, to-do lists are very individual. Some of my more my executive CEO level clients, we I, we, we form up to-do lists that are um, that, that executive assistants have access to and can help them maintain. But in general, uh, you maintain a to-do list one one to-do list that is in a format that you like. If you are um, an out, heavy Outlook user. There's a great uh, tool, Outlook Tasks, is in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. It's, it's just, it's right there, it's handy. It, it syncs well with most mobile devices. Sometimes there are hiccups with iPhone or Droid, and if you would like um, information on th that synchronization, just shoot me an email from my website, and I'll give that to you individually. But anyway, so Outlook Tasks, right there for you. It's a great way to inventory all the things that you have on your plate. Conversely, you, a paper list, if you have a manageable volume of to-do items, can also serve quite well, and there's nothing wrong with that. But again, if you're constantly having to search through your paper to-do list to find what you need to do, you may need to consider something different. 
Um, but, but also an Excel spreadsheet, you know, that's, that's sortable and searchable, and, and that can accommodate a lot of, of meetings and a lot of action items. And you can put dates in there and next steps and really customize it to, to your work. So that, that, that's a main benefit of something like Excel. So, but basically with to-do list, choose a format that, you, that you're drawn to, that, that you think will work well for you. And, if, when, and when it stops working well, when you find yourself not being as effective as you want to be, when you're losing track of things, that may be a time to reconsider it. But, but you know, give a, a single unified to-do list a try and give every to-do item a date on which you wish to make progress on it. <laughs> because that is, I mean, otherwise it will sit there and just kind of go, hello, I'm a to-do, I live on your list, I've been here forever. But give every single item on your to-do list a date on which you wish to make progress. And, and, and that way you can quickly find the things to work on from what can sometimes be a very long list of items. Yeah, and I would just like to say, you know, collab you mentioned collaboration and the importance mm -hmm. of having something that's shareable whenever mm -hmm. you're collaborating with teammates. Um, there are a lot of meeting professionals who are very tied to their Excel spreadsheets and they feel very guilty about using such an old fangled thing. But <gasps> I would, I know. But I would say that, you know, if that's the format in which you process information the best, mm -hmm. go ahead and use it and don't feel guilty about it. But just mm -hmm. know that the spreadsheet doesn't just have to live on your desktop. It can right. also be copied and pasted to something like Google Docs, mm -hmm. um, which is now you know drive.google.com. But that's a place where you can share and collaborate on spreadsheets, where mm -hmm. you can share and collaborate on presentations, on Word documents. Um, and I know internally in our team, like I'll put survey data and information, you know, ROI on different programs that people are participating in, and then anyone can share it or comment on it or mm -hmm. use it. Um, I, I'm working with a large team of, of lawyers right now, and they collaborate with a spreadsheet. I mean, an Excel spreadsheet saved on a network drive at their firm, and that is how they keep track of every open case and what the next steps are, and who's got what you know what action and what they're doing. And they have they have a meeting where they run the spreadsheet once a week and make sure that everything is progressing normally. It, it doesn't have to be high tech, but it does have to be used. What it's, it's not so much the methodology. It's not so much the car, it's the driver, you know, I mean, because, you know, I, I could have a Maserati and I would still drive at 35 miles an hour, but, you know, I would, I'm just, but you know, choose a tool that you like and then that you can dedicate yourself to and it's the use of it. It's, it's going to it two to three times a day at least and updating yourself and updating the list and keeping on track. Agreed. And, uh, and I, I just wanted to also mention a tool you had mentioned uh, about having the shared calendars and people mm -hmm. being able to access that. If you want to schedule things like meetings or conference calls with people, um, but you don't necessarily, it's not people that you want to share your whole calendar mm -hmm. and life with, um, there is an online schedule tool called Doodle. I love Doodle. That is so fun. It's so easy. Yes, yes, yes. And so you can you can fill out a uh, do a Doodle and give options, and people just check which options work for them, and it's free, and they don't even have to register for anything. That's what I like the most about it because if you send something out that someone has to register for, they feel like they're going to get a whole bunch of spam, and so, and but you don't get that with Doodle. The other thing with Outlook 2010, if you or N13, it, there is an option to share a calendar. There's a button in the ribbon that says share calendar and you can construct an email that will share the calendar details with someone outside of your organization and you can and you can say you know what the time range is and all sorts of good stuff. So yes, share calendar from Outlook is also a good feature. Um, so you had mentioned Outlook a few different times. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that that is something that you kind of specialize in and I know from speaking with people informally at different events that a lot of our audience is using Outlook. Yes. Do you have um, tips that are, you know, Outlook specific or just email specific ways that people can kind of get control of all the stuff that just lands in their inbox? Sure, sure. And if it's okay, I'm going to share my screen with okay. our viewers. And uh, give me just a second. And in the meantime, if any of you have uh, specific questions that you would like us to address. Um, or if you have comments on things that we may have already shared, feel free to go ahead and uh, you can tweet at PYM Live 
Um, you can leave comments on the YouTube video itself or on the event page from wherever you're watching. All right, are we ready? We are, yeah, I see your okay. screen. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Okay, this is an Outlook inbox, and down here in the lower left-hand corner, you can see the Outlook taskbar. One of the best ways that I know of to simultaneously manage your email and your action items is to use Outlook's drag-and-drop functionality. Now, my September um, MBG organizing newsletter covered this in depth, so if you want to see screenshots and more details on this, please go to my website. In the lower right-hand corner, there are newsletters archives and you can see um, I think the newsletter was called my favorite outlook trick and here it is so let's say that I have this email that is an action item for me I need to do something with this now you can't see what I'm doing with my mouse but I'm going to click and hold the left mouse button click drag release and I get an outlook task you can see that this is a task window up here the subject of the task is the subject of my email, and I would change this to the, to the action that I need to perform. The due date, I would choose that as my progress date, not the deadline, because I don't want to be reminded on the deadline. I want to be reminded when I want to do it. So I want to call this person tomorrow. I get a reminder, save and close. And now on my task list, I have a task that tells me what I need to do tomorrow. So click and drag is a great tip with Outlook tasks to help you convert an email in, hello, into a, a task that you can be reminded about. Because here's the deal. Why remember anything? Seriously. Why force yourself to remember anything? It's, that's an outdated and, and not very realistic way to keep track of, of, of action items, just to kind of keep it all in your head. Because there's really classic research in the area of psychology that says that human beings can only remember it's seven plus or minus two. So between five and nine pieces of information at any one time. So if you're managing a thousand meetings a year, I guarantee you, you have more than five to nine action items to perform. So why remember anything? Put it on a task list, put it on a to-do list. If you have an email, Click and drag it to Outlook Tasks, and you'll have the content there all ready for you. So that that is my that is by far my favorite Outlook tip. Cool. And I know from using because I don't use Outlook, I use a different. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a mail server, and it does it has the same functionality. So even if you're not on Outlook, you probably have the ability to create rules. Um, there was actually a great tip in a newsletter that you sent yesterday, Melissa, about. Um, you know, kind of automatically like making sure that all the spam newsletters or whatever mm -hmm. goes into a folder Re instead of into yes. your yes. inbox. And so, uh -huh. you know, Google does that. Similarly, Mail Great. does that. Apple mm -hmm. Mail does that. Like all. So I would, you know, if you feel overwhelmed by your email inbox, I would encourage you to just do a Google search for tutorials, and I'm sure you'll find a million videos and stories about these amazing functionalities that you didn't even realize yes. your email was capable of that Absolutely. can get rid of the distractions and help keep you on track. Perfect, um, perfect. Can we talk a little bit about online project management tools and, sure. and strategies for you know, keeping track of not only what you're doing, which you, know, you can do by email your checklist, but also what team members are doing and sharing right. data like that. Right. Well, first of all, the definition for me of a project is a task with two or more steps to it. So it's a very broad definition that I have. And there are, there are several ways to manage a project. If, if you really are only wanting to manage your action items, your milestones and deliverables with a project, that can be done with your, all your other to-dos. Okay, so and there in Outlook, if you're using tasks, for example, you can have an Outlook task for your project and in the notes section of the task window you would just list the things that you yourself need to do with this project. So I don't recommend keep separating that out if you don't have to because again, one place, one place, one place, if at all possible. But like you said, Christy, if you need to collaborate with others and you need to get feedback and messages and share files and all sorts of stuff, there's some great project management tools out there. And the two that I am most familiar with are Basecamp, which is the flagship, you know, 
cloud-based project management tool, and then there is an, another one called 5PM, which I like to recommend because it's um, cheaper and it has a lot of the same features. So you can check out 5PM. It's the number 5pmweb.com. So it's a great, great tool. And what those share in common is the ability to do shared task lists, um, Gantt charts, reporting, you can send messages from within the tool. And the advantage of sending a message to each to your project team members from within the tool is that it's then archived with the rest of the project correspond with project information, all the tasks. So you would have the tasks, you would have all the back and forth correspondence, and you can have file shares in these places as well. So you can do calendars and, and blog-like conversations. And it's, it's very helpful to have all of that consolidated into one place on a, on a particular tool. With, and you can do that with 5 p.m. or with Basecamp. And, and if you're overseeing lots of projects, you can do reporting and see which projects are behind, ahead, whatever. And so there's lots of reporting features there as well. If you don't want to pay the monthly fee and the, the, the per seat licensing fees for these types of programs, there is a, a, a free version called FreedCamp. Um, that's all I know. There you go, FreedCamp, F-R-E-E-D-C-A-M-P. And my understanding from one of my clients is that it gives you the, the fun stuff of Basecamp, but it's free. So there you go. But it's it's good to have these because then you can have people automatically update the status of action items and collaborate on 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 projects and even files. There can be what some of these have whiteboards where you can sit there like almost like the Google Drive and collaborate on a single file in one place. So there's lots of great features of project management, but the main thing is whether you're using a, a cloud-based tool or you're using something like Microsoft Project, it's it's allowing multiple people to have access to it. So if you use Microsoft Project, for example, then whoever you want to have access to your information also has to buy Microsoft Project and have it loaded on their machine. And it has to be, you have to have a, a like a network drive where you can share files and PDFs and da 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 So um, pros and cons to every approach. There's no perfect solution, but that is, but those are some ideas for how to manage collaborative projects. Yeah, and you know, I think the problem with technology isn't that you can't find something to do what you want it to do. The problem is narrowing down your options when yes. the prices are so all over the place and the user experience is so different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we in-house use Basecamp and we love mm -hmm. it, but the problem with Basecamp is that if someone sees that something is assigned to them and then they don't comment on it or change the dates, and then once that due date is passed, it's not like somebody goes and kicks them in the head and says, hey, you messed up and you missed this deadline. Yep. So, um, so that's what my job is. And then I say, hey, um, next time when you look at it, make sure you, you know, and then you also have to train people how to use it because oh, yes. all yep. of these online project management systems are great. They all give you the ability to bucket things into different projects and, mm -hmm. to, um, and to figure out, you know, who's doing what, are they doing it when, assign different tasks to different people, be able to look at one calendar view, be able to look at, <clears throat> one person and their responsibilities, look at yourself and everything that's assigned to you. But I found the biggest challenge has been taking the time to actually train the team how to enter the jobs and the to-dos and the projects correctly. Yes. Um, so I, for me, that's a huge time waster. Uh -huh. So can you address um, how to educate people on using new systems that will save them a lot of time, save them a lot of stress when it seems like people don't read their emails, pay attention, take notes. Absolutely. Listen. And there, there's always the need to train. If, we're, if we can never assume that we can just put something out there and not tell anyone how to use it. So there will always be a need to train. And that needs to be factored. If it's, if it's new associates coming into your organization, it should be part of their, their onboarding. Now, the training itself, it, it, it's simply a matter of, of getting the, I would say, get the people who are already expert in the system to devise job aids and, and short little snippets. That, that, that can be accessed on an ongoing basis. So there, it's, there's just no, not really any magic to it, Christy, other than that training has to occur. That, but also, um, my main thing is, once the training occurs, where I see things fall short is the accountability piece. 
like you were saying, that the accountability for putting every project in the system, the accountability for following up on the action items. That's the piece that I see people struggle with the most. They have a great system for managing projects, but they don't have, like you said, any accountability to, to follow up on them. Now, the systems you can put in place where you don't have one person having to be watchdog and go around going, who did it, um, is to have regular project team meetings where the action items are always um, addressed you know, from the last meeting. So that we, they, there's like this um, mutual accountability approach where we get together and we talk about what's done, what's not done. A project can't run itself and no system can run itself. Like I said, a car is only as good as its driver. So do pick a good system but make sure that you have the ability to train, and it doesn't have to be a stand-up course necessarily, although I have done those. It can be a job aid, it can be a 10-minute video that you used, that you filmed and, and used Camtasia on. It can be something that is, is you know, just always accessible to the users of the system, but training's got to happen, but more importantly, accountability for it has got to be followed up on. Yeah, and if you are managing a team and you need kind of a, a place to start in terms of figuring out how to organize them, there's a great book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Mm -hmm. um, and he, um, and exactly, the, the accountability is, is so huge and, and the trust. And I think another big time waster is people trying to micromanage people on their team and, and trying to, you know, they tell them what to do, but then they don't trust it's going to get done, or they decide, oh, you know what, somebody else should be doing this, but it'll take me longer to explain it, to, then I'll, I'll just do it myself. And I think that's a huge... Oh, huge. ...time waster, too. So mm -hmm. what would you recommend to those uh, control freaks out there? Mm. How, how I never work with control freaks. No, no I'm kidding. Um, control freaks who, are, who worry about trusting others. The first thing I will say is we need to make sure that we have expectations clearly delineated for the entire team. It's, it's really beyond job descriptions. Most um, companies of any size that have ever hired someone have some sort of job description or at least the verbiage they posted on you know, careerbuilder.com the last time they filled the position. So they have some sort of job description. If you don't, that's a, good, that's a good place to start. But the expectations are a bit more specific for each job and that's how teams can learn to collaborate and know whose sandbox is whose I mean whose accountability is whose so you would you would develop a list of expectations underneath each um, major heading of a job description to say if this then that I call them if then scenarios real creative right and so you have if this happens then you do that if that happens then you do that and if we can really understand amongst the team members what those if-then scenarios are, like if a project, you know, comes into your email, then go into Basecamp and launch a new project. You know, if, if an action item is, is completed, then go into Basecamp and update the to-do and mark it complete. So outlining the if-then scenarios and clear, clearly outlining our expectations of each member of the team is a great way to get past the, well, I don't trust that they'll do it, or the, the oh, I didn't know that was my job aspect. So once you know what everybody's uh, jobs are, then the way you put that into action, this is where I, I get into with my clients, um, only keep the stuff that is that you're supposed to keep, that you're accountable for keeping email, paper, electronic files. Don't turn into the, you know, the company librarian. You know, if, if you don't, if you're not the owner of a process, you need to count on the person who does own that process or project to keep the, the information on it. And then you go to them when you need it. But if, if we're all keeping duplicates of everybody else's stuff, then it makes it all too easy psychologically for us to get into their into their sandbox, into their area. So if I whether I actually say Christy, you and I are working together, whether I actually trust you or not, if I delete all of your project updates that you send me, then it forces me to view you as the owner of those project updates and to have to come to you for information when I need it. So I make my actions match what I should be thinking and then it creates a little cognitive dissonance. I'm sorry, I'm a shrink. I can't help myself. And then, um, and then my, my, my be beliefs tend to, to follow suit. So keep what you're supposed to. Let the, the owners of the project and the processes keep what they're supposed to. And that way you can operationalize what you're trying to do anyway, which is respect other people's um, jobs and, and your expectations of them and stay out of it. So what about the people who um, are working under the control freaks and the micromanagers mm -hmm. and 
you know, they're concerned about project, you know, project scope. So, you know, this is my job, this is what mm -hmm. I'm responsible for, and whether it's, oh, you know, there are a couple people on my team who aren't holding their weight, or mm -hmm. whether it's this client now wants X, Y, and Z on top of mm -hmm. what we've already negotiated. Um, do you have any tips for how to communicate and reinforce what those expectations are, where mm -hmm. the job begins and ends without getting fired? <laughs> Absolutely. And the difference, Christy, between whining about your workload and making a business case for additional resources or redeployment, okay, so we have on one hand whining, on the other hand a business case. The difference between those two is data. Is information. Go into your boss's office saying, I'm so busy, I have so much work to do, and you will get nowhere. Go into your boss's office and say, I have um, six meetings on the calendar right now. This one that was originally supposed to be a local, you know, 30 person event has now turned into a 300 person global, you know, exposition. Um, and and the, in the giving your boss data, information on which to make decisions. And then Asking the, the wonderful question, what comes first? What are my priorities? But if you don't have that overall all list of your projects or priorities, if you don't, if you're not keeping that, if you're trying to keep it all in your head, then you're gonna go in there and complain about this amorphous busyness and workload and it net it won't go over well. So the difference between whining and making a business case is data. How do you get data? You keep a very organized to-do list that you can look at from both a you know, detailed level of what the specific tasks are as well as a rolled up big picture level of what the what projects that you have on your plate right now what is and what's coming down the pike. I think another thing that makes a big difference with people who are in management um, you know everybody's busy like that's really not an excuse for right. not getting things that done. Never, yeah, or, that we're all busy yeah. So, so I think another thing that really helps is not coming to your supervisors or your managers or your clients with problems, but coming to them with solutions. Yes. Um, and, you know, in improv, there's, uh, you're not allowed to say no to people. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, one, of the, one of the principal tenets is anything you're given is a gift. And, uh, and, you know, it's always more interesting to be happy about the gift and to find a way to put that gift to use. And so I think that's something that meeting planners kind of understand inherently, whether or not they've ever articulated it, because so much happens that you just don't expect on an mm -hmm. event, on an event site, that you just make work. Right. Um, so, yeah, but I think, you know, a lot of times it's easy to forget in a work situation, especially, you know, there are so many people who do just kind of draw a line in the sand, they go, mm, well, that's not my job. Mm, yeah. So, um, cool. Yeah, I, you know, it was really funny. You were talking earlier about some of the other online um, project management systems, and we had kind of touched on this, but I did want to welcome anybody who's viewing virtually. If you have um, tips on time management, or if yes. you have, uh, you know, little email tricks you use to keep on schedule, or if there are online project management tools that, that you love, because I, I do think it's, it's a very individual um, approach, it's whatever you know you kind of sync with and, and find useful and can use, please share those with us. You can tweet them at PYM Live, um, and we're going to be starting uh, a regular column <laughs> called uh, Tech Cage Match, because uh, you know we were discussing nice. Basecamp and 5 p.m., and so Melissa, I might actually enlist <laughs> you, yeah, I might actually enlist you to write about the pros and cons for that, and then um, I might get David Wagner, who I believe just signed on with his office, to uh, to write something about Podio because that's something that mm -hmm. uh, he's very, very passionate about. But so, if there's something you're passionate about that you would like to share, please let me know because we love to. 99% of our content is created by our community, so that you are learning from people who are in the trenches executing the meetings um, to help you work better and more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Cool. So. Um, one thing that you mentioned before we started the broadcast that I thought was really beautiful was um, just that you know the individual and the individual mm -hmm. solutions. Can you can you give us some insight into 
how you kind of help people find their way to the solutions that best work for them or absolutely and, and the, it comes from my background I study and research about people at work and what makes them productive what makes them satisfied all, all sorts of stuff and the the basic principle of psychology is the study of individual differences so I can tell you that that's that's foundational to me and that that's that's the the, the tenant on which I base my work that what I would do with one client will be very different than what I do with another client. There are some commonalities like pick one to-do list that, that, you know, that I recommend for most everyone. But notice I didn't say everyone. Most everyone. And, and I would just encourage you to say, all right, first of all, the question you would ask yourself is, what, what, where are my action items coming? You know, is it mostly via email? Is it in meetings? Is it when I am on the road? What, you know, when am, when and where am I being hit with things to do? So what? So that that should be a foundational aspect of the, the system you choose because it, sometimes it, things need to be very portable. Some, and, it, you, and you may not be able to count on the fact that you got a you know pad of paper attached to your hip or whatnot. Maybe you need to have something that's that's accessible through your mobile device or your iPad. So that would be the first thing. How mobile and where am I and what am I doing when I'm receiving my action items? Then the second thing is. What what feels that this is very touchy feely? What feels right to you? Um, what what are you drawn toward? Are you a very tactile person when you walk through a, a clothing store? Do you, are you touching things? Is that is that part of your experience with with I, with the external world? Is is through touch? If so, then you might be one of those that finds the the apps and the online tools a bit cold. You may. You may want a paper-based tool, and then you'll have to, to work work with that if, if it works in the first instance about portable and, and volume of items. But the main thing to keep in mind is that when you see, when you look at your neighbor, your very organized and effective neighbor, and you're like, oh, gee, I'd like to be like them, um, it's, it, the, the kicker is not to necessarily think what do they do that what do they use? If they use you know, Toodle Do, or if they use Remember the Milk, maybe that's what I should use. Uh, not to try to mimic what you know, the, the exact tool that they're using, but rather ask them how they use it. What are they doing to be effective with it? And I think you'll find out you can morph almost any a time management tool, it is, as high tech or low tech as is possible, to to work for you and to as, as long as again you are attending to it on a very very regular basis because it's the car it's the driver not the car so yeah so so don't feel like you have to be high tech and don't feel like you're behind the times or old fashioned or whatever it is if you choose a low tech time management tool it's it, the most important thing is how you use it so you had mentioned that that central to what your area of study was is figuring out what makes people more productive at work and makes mm -hmm. them more satisfied at work. Can you talk to us a little bit about what those are and how people can be more productive and happier? Absolutely. Um, one thing that is a big pain point, I'll start with the converse, one thing that's a big pain point for my clients is the seemingly never-ending incoming volume of email. And the, the feeling of, of needing to be constantly and and immediately responsive to every incoming message and that is a that is a mindset that will lead to a lot of dissatisfaction at work because when you when you feel like I've got to when I've got to listen to every little bleep and bling and window that pops up and and immediately respond then you are constantly firefighting you are constantly being interrupted and every time you're interrupted in the course of performing a task it will take you you know anywhere between 5 and 25 minutes to get back to that task if you ever do at all so if you are feeling like you're jumping around from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing and you're never getting anything done that can be a major stressor and cause of job dissatisfaction so the first recommendation I would make would be to turn off all those alerts of incoming mail on your laptops on your you know, desktops, on your phones, on your iPads. I had a, um, a client office that they had no less than seven alerts going on in the office before every meeting. And it was like, you know, a, a parade. Everybody does get ready for this meeting. And let, so I would encourage you to um, turn off the alerts of incoming mail. 
particularly and making sure that you are going in and processing your email on a regular basis, you, you determine how often that needs to be. Some of my clients say three to four times a day is more than sufficient. Some clients say I do it at the top of every hour, but giving yourself permission to step away from that, that, that bing, 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 and actually doing work, um, and then returning to it when you're at a stopping point, that is the most wonderful gift you can give yourself and will increase your job satisfaction and lower your stress profoundly. The other thing that I will recommend to improve that, rewind, at the end of the day, what we're going for is a feeling of, of accomplishment, okay? We, we want to know what we got done and know what we need to do tomorrow. Really, that, that's about as straightforward as I can make it. You're never going to get everything done in a single day, okay? We, that's, that's called job security. <laughs> and and so, so we can't, I would, I would encourage you to alter the expectation that you are going to mark everything off of your to-do list every day. Because a full 80% of those items either happen again, or you have to follow up on, or you just didn't get to. So in terms of mark it off, it's done, yeehaw, that's about 20% of your daily task list, okay, just to set your expectations. But that's the key, is knowing what you got done, that little 20%, and knowing what you need to do the next day. There is a tremendous sense of peace in that when you're not forcing yourself to remember things and to, to, to dig for the action items, oh, where was I, what was I supposed to be doing, you will give yourself some, a tremendous gift by simply downloading your brain. Da David Allen, the GTD founder, talks about mind like water. And it, it's basically downloading everything that you're trying to swirl around in your brain onto a list. Um, I was working with a, a professor at a local college a couple of months ago, and I said, okay, we're going to sit here and we're going to make a list of all the things that you're trying to remember. I've never seen anyone make a list this long, but at 73 items he stopped. This was just what was swirling around in his head and he looked at me and he goes, I have not felt this good in over a year. And I said, you think? I mean, so, so don't force yourself to be, to, to be a, a, a to-do list, have, have a brain-based to-do list. So, you, you know, release your, your, the grip email has on you. Put things down on your task list. When they come in via email, they go into the task list. And that is, those are the two best recommendations I can make to improve job satisfaction and decrease stress and improve your work-life balance as well. Yeah, I have to agree with a lot of what you're saying because when I was pregnant a few years ago, I, up until that point, had been probably working close to 12-hour days. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, and then all of a sudden, the first trimester, I would get exhausted at 5 o'clock. Like, that was it. Like, I just couldn't. Uh -huh. I couldn't do anything. I had to leave. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. um and what's and a really funny thing happened. Uh, everything that needed to get done got done, mm -hmm. and nothing that was important went undone. Mm -hmm. But it but I it I really had to be strict with it, and so that was when I started to really list things and and make sure that they were there. And 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 another funny thing just recently happened where. Um, you know, Tim Ferriss in the four hour work week recommends that you always have an out of office reminder and give people a phone number they can call if they really have to get in touch with you. And, uh, and you know, I actually had a legitimate reason because I was traveling every week for probably six to eight weeks in a row. Mm -hmm. And I went from getting 2,000 emails a day to getting about 25. Interesting. Just in those six weeks of just, and it, and because it, it not only said that I was out of the office, it said, you know, if this is a press release, this is the person you should really be sending it to. So mm -hmm. please update your list. If it's about marketing for this, this person can help you. If it's anything else, this person can help you. And so I think, you know, not everybody, I still get press releases, but, um, it it just relieves me so much. <laughs> you don't have to be the traffic cop. As no, much. Yes. yeah. And so what I find works best for me, and it may not work you know, well for anybody else, or maybe it mm -hmm. helps people figure out what might work for them, is uh, before I leave work, I create a list of the things that I have to accomplish the next mm -hmm. day. Um, and sometimes I'll even block it out in time. Like if I know that I have a hangout with Melissa at 1 o'clock, I'll block out, okay, well, up until this point, I'll work on survey data, and then after this point, I'll work on story ideas, uh -huh. or 
you know, this morning I'm going to take for writing. And so I kind of block out my day so that when I show up, I don't have to waste time making that list at the very beginning. I already mm -hmm. know what I'm supposed to be doing when I start in. Mm -hmm. um, and then if I ever manage to complete everything on my list, which sometimes happens, yay! Yay! I can go to base camp and see what else people have assigned to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I like using those kind of in tandem. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Greg Herning was speaking at a PYM Live event in Atlanta earlier this year, and he also recommended, uh, you know, if you find that you can't find 30 minutes a day to exercise, or you feel like your work-life balance is completely out of whack because you're so tightly scheduled, go ahead and schedule in family time. Go ahead and schedule in yeah. exercise, and let the alerts go off and be like, oh, got to go. Yeah. It's like an appointment, and, and Stephen Covey once said, I can tell what's important to any person by looking at their calendar. Now, keep in mind, Christy, that I read that line when I was on a plane with my company feeling quite the hotshot 28-year-old, um, and not that there are any hotshot 28-year-olds on the call today, um, but there I was. Be, I, actually, I was. There might be a few. I, I was. I was. <laughs> and, and so I, I opened up what, was, what I was using at that time, which was my Franklin Planner. And I looked through it and I said, okay, what would someone think about me by looking at my calendar? And I looked at it and it was actually um, quite the uh, shock because I, I, you would not have been able to tell that I was married or had a child by looking at my calendar. You would have thought I was a workaholic who did nothing but um, travel. And that was a slap in the face to me. And part of what inspired me to to balance myself better. So your calendar should reflect your priorities. You're, you should have one calendar. You do not hang up your humanity when you walk in the office. I, I'm a firm believer of one calendar for both personal and professional uh, obligations and that on my calendar you will see you know take kid to swim lessons alongside you know, meet with CEO of, of XYZ company. And it, th those things are, are there, and I am a whole person. And I can tell that by looking at my calendar. I am, by having one, it's, it's just, it's, it's, I'm much more balanced. I love what you said. You don't have to hang up your humanity when you walk into the office. Um, and I hope that that's something that inspires uh, the people who are watching this video right now or uh, on demand. And I wanted to, um, you know, close out kind of the conversation with, um, you have mentioned in your newsletters, rituals. Mm -hmm. Talk to us the importance of rituals in a day and how that ties into time management or sure. satisfaction at work. Sure. First you get incense and you start burning it and then you chant. No. Um, <laughs> no. Um, rituals this is a way of just of developing a good habit to, to like to, to drive the car well and, and, and there are two particular rituals that I recommend they are not on your calendar I recommend you put them on your calendar the first is your opening ritual the thing that the first 10 minutes of your work day and what you what you do with that and then the second is duh your closing ritual now let's start with the closing ritual and what what it looks like I this if, if you struggle with boundaries with um, leaving work at work and not checking your email at 11 o'clock at night and da, da 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 it oftentimes can be because you haven't clocked out. Remember the old time clocks that you see in movies where they used to physically you know, put a card into a clock and it went bang and they were out? Boy, wasn't that nice. I mean, a nice auditory reminder that you're no longer working. Uh, a closing ritual can do the same thing psychologically for you because it'll be on your calendar and Ding, it's time to have my closing ritual and during that time you review your to review and update your to-do list okay what did I get done what did I need what do I need to change the progress dates on what you know what's happening that this that, and the other Re get it all squared away add anything that arrived during the day don't sleep on it don't keep it in your head add it to the to-do list and then so update the to-do list 
review your calendar for the next two days. If it's Friday, you'll review it for the entire next week and think about what do I need to prepare for? Is there any just so I won't be blindsided? So you do a, ta a to do list review, a calendar review, and then you do um, <clears throat> Christy a desktop review, and you look at the papers on your desk and you you sort you search through there to see what needs to be thrown away, what needs to be added to the to do list, and what needs to be filed if anything. So you kind of review what's on your desk surface. Additionally, I mean you can add anything in there that you want to, such as an email inbox review. Some of my clients very successfully achieve inbox zero at the end of every day by during their 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 closing ritual, going ahead and doing the FAT approach, file action toss, file action toss with everything in yeah, it's good fat. Yay. Um, in their email. File it, drag it to tasks if it's an action item, or toss, which is the delete. Uh, so they do that during their closing ritual, but they're not answering emails. They're not getting that last little bit of work done. Work's done. You're, you're, you're doing your closing ritual. So that's that. Then the opening ritual can often be um, singular where you are just kind of saying, all right, what's on the, the menu for today? And just making sure nothing has changed overnight if you're in that type of industry. But some of my, my leaders will have morning meetings with their executive assistants during that opening ritual, say, what have you got for me? You got anything for me to sign? You got anything for me to do? Some of my um, my leaders will do um, very quick, you know, five to ten minute team huddles, you know, just to touch base with everybody. That's called interruption prevention, by the way. If you go ahead and give them that time, they're less likely to interrupt you later on. So the, the opening ritual can be either individual looking at what you've got on, on the, the list for today or spending a little bit of time with your with those with whom you work. And ritual just means you do it regularly. Now, did I say perfectly in every day? No, I said regularly. So you, you may consider it a success if you do, if you do your closing ritual three times a week, you know, because that's all you're in the office. I mean, but don't strive for perfection and then abandon all hope if you don't achieve it. So just just get get in there, get it done as much as you can, and forgive yourself when you don't. <laughs> Forgiving yourself is very very important yes, because we very. are all our own worst critics. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I love the idea of the the fat email mm -hmm. because I am guilty of having 3,000 emails in my inbox at all times because I answer what's important maybe once or twice a day and then I ignore everything else. Yes, as um, one of the, the founders of my field says, uh, clutter is delayed decisions. <laughs> clutter is delayed decisions and you and you haven't FAT'd your inbox. So you ha you only have three decisions to make there, Christy: file, action, or toss. So don't delay it because you'll just force yourself to have to come back to it again and again and again. Yeah. So I I've managed to get to inbox zero probably about five times this year. Yay! And the out of office memo has helped me yeah. narrow down the amount of demand. So I, I'm very excited to add the fat to my list too. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much for joining us today. I really thank appreciate you. it. I know um, there's kind of been some staggered viewing of this mm -hmm. video, so. Uh, if you have questions, even after we sign off, um, go ahead and, and tweet them out to at PYM Live. Go mm -hmm. ahead and make comments on the video or on the event page, and we'll get back to you. Um, and Melissa, will you share with us how people can get in touch with you or find more time management tips? Absolutely. Um, please go to my website. It's listed right below my, my head right here. And in, in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, it says join our newsletter. And Give me your name and your email address and you'll hear from me once a month, the last Tuesday of every month. And I write an article on a time management, email management, paper management topic that I'm inspired about. For, for the month, and this past month that you received uh, yesterday, Christy, was about was contained Outlook tips, and I'm continuing along that that line. In uh, next month's issue, will also be will conclude my Outlook tips, and then I'll I'll progress on. But you'll get time management tips, and and it's a great way to just continue to remind yourself that these things are important, that it is important to to take time to plan and organize. It it will help you achieve good results. And I also please feel free to follow me on Twitter at Melissa Gracious and I'm also on Facebook and LinkedIn and all those other places as well so I'd love to connect with uh, the viewers today in those ways but definitely go to my website and sign up for my newsletter if you like what you heard today so thank you so much. No problem and there are definitely are some people who enjoyed what you had to say I know Band of the Planner said uh, gracias Dr. Gracious. You're welcome. And uh, Lori, Lorelai Events was very excited about the it's not the car it's the driver yes. that, that you gave her. And, awesome. uh, yeah, so thank you so much. Um, Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, virtual audience, for tuning in and deciding that we were worth 
54 minutes of your time. Uh, plan well and prosper, friends, and I'll see you on the flip side.